recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's great to have you here. Some folks were asking me, hey, you talk about Nimble Streamer at the top of every show. Well, what on earth is Nimble Streamer? And it's really, really cool. So as a webcaster, as a broadcaster, one of the things that um, one of the things that we need to be able to achieve is being able to send a signal to multiple endpoints. I think churches and businesses are also experiencing this right now um, because we're in this strange time where even non-broadcasters are having to broadcast and we're finding things like, well, not all of our viewers or congregants or staff are on Facebook. So we need to also be able to stream to YouTube and we need to also be able to stream HLS to a Roku player and things like that. So, so what's really, really cool about Nimble Streamer is that I have it installed on a co-located server which has a 100 megabit fiber connection. And that fiber connection is basically our backbone. I don't have that here. I only get, well, I only get, I, I'm actually really, really pleased about what we get here in our new studio, Studio E. I'm getting about 40 megabits per second upstream, but that's not enough to stream to a thousand people simultaneously. So what we do, is we send a single stream. So right now, I am sending a single stream out to the internet to our co-located box, which has Nimble Streamer installed on it. It's just a Debian machine. It's actually got Debian stretch on it. It's due for an upgrade. And uh, with Nimble Streamer, what it does is it takes that stream that we send it. It's like an RTMP stream and it converts it to the different formats that are required and it sends it to all of the different endpoints. So that's YouTube, Facebook, Roku, Kodi, Plex, HLS, set-top boxes, over the top, um, Vimeo, and, and everywhere, all from one feed. So what is Nimble Streamer? It's like, it's like the, the master kind of um, just, how, like redistributor of our live feed. And if you're trying to do live video and you're trying to get live video out there right now, it's the only way to do it. It's really, really fantastic. And uh, you, you'll want to follow the links below in order to, uh, in the description below, you'll find a link to Nimble Streamer, which will take you there. So things are a little odd around here at Category 5 as well. I'm not actually in the studio. I'm in the producer's room as you might have noticed. So this is where I produce the show. Never intended to be a broadcast studio. Well, why am I actually here for episode number 648? Well, that comes down to the fact that through this pandemic, it's been a challenge for me. It's been a challenge for all of us, hasn't it? But it's been a challenge for me to get to this point where we can broadcast. I am live, so hi there everybody, Skywriter64, Marshman, um, sad sack 963 hello, and I did see Solbu and Mini Marsh, BobK54, Noman5, um, so I'm here live, but the... And, and so we're broadcasting live through Nimble Streamer and, and from Wirecast. So this is Telestream Wirecast. When I say Telestream Wirecast, that's what this is. But I can't have a contractor come to our studio. I can't have our builder come here and run the necessary cabling and the conduit in order to get the feed from there, the, the next room over our studio to where I am sitting right now, which is the producer's room. So this is where everything is meant to come to. So 
everything comes in over here, I mean, that's what it is meant to happen. So this corner here is kind of going to be where all the cabling comes in from our main studio into our main broadcast rig, which is here. You can't really see it. It's off camera, but it is right here. Like this, this stuff is sitting on top of the server. This is our server rack. So I have our main storage servers here. Our data backup is here. So this is the, the unit that I can, I can pull a drive and take this drive home with me. And this is a Luke's encrypted 10 terabyte hard drive. And it's a mirror, so it's constantly being mirrored to multiple hard drives. Um, then we've got our audio rack up here. So as you can see, audio is happening right now as I speak. So I'm speaking on a lapel tonight, as opposed to the headsets that we used to use. Um, and it comes into our audio rig. So here's the audio receivers for my mic pack. So it is wireless, and these are the antennas for that, which are able to get through the wall just no problem at all, just like butter. And uh, then we've got uh, an Ultramizer Pro audio processor, which is a compressor, so that makes sure that I'm not too loud, not too quiet. Then we've got a Sonic Maximizer from BBE, which is uh, essentially that is uh, an audio exciter. So we, uh, we add a little bit of Christmas to the sound with this unit here. If I turn that off, you're going to notice the difference, so watch this. Now it is off, and you can immediately hear that it's just not as sweet. And in the industry, we call that Christmas. But uh, it's, this, it's that little shimmer on the, on the microphone. So when I turn that back on, now it's back on, and now you can hear the difference. And then this guy here from American Audio is just simply so that I can see that our mics are working. That's just a, a VU, volume unit indicator. And... Uh, and that kind of is everything that goes on there. But over here, which you can't see, is our entire audio rack. Um, so this is where the task cam is. So, um, so everything is going through a mixer over here. I will show you in a, in a virtual tour uh, in time as we kind of get things set up. But so all that to say, everything is very, very makeshift. And I know you can't really see how makeshift it is right now, but wires are strewn. Like, do you see this? This is one of the wires that is critical to tonight's broadcast. <laughs> so this is kind of how things are going. This is a wire that is critical to tonight's broadcast. These are the, the cables that are feeding back my mic audio into the, the rack that I showed you here from the mixer, which is over here. So everything is very makeshift because we can't hire in the helping hands that we need in order to get everything done. So I'm here doing the best that I possibly can to do my best to be ready to bring you a show and we're not quite there. I, I feel like we're about three weeks out and I promised that I would be on the air and broadcasting by this time. So April 22nd was our, was our date that we had arbitrarily set and achieved never knowing that there was going to be this pandemic never knowing that we were not going to be able to just get the con contractor in, get Jeff and Henry over here and, and do the news and do everything else that we need to do. Uh, we do have a treat for you today because there is one person who is allowed to be within six feet of me, and that is my wonderful wife, Rebecca. And so she is going to be joining us to, uh, to provide the news today. We also have Robert uh, Koenig, who is here with us vicariously through the interwebs from Florida. Um, as you know, he brings us his show from, uh, from the comfort of his home. And that is the Crypto Corner, which is going to be coming up in just a few minutes' time as well. So we're looking forward to that. Now... There's a series that we're going to be starting here on Category 5 Technology TV, and that is to do with advanced routing technology from Microtech. It's called Router Board. I want to show you this thing. This is a, a router board. Um, this one is called the HAP AC Router Board RB962UIGS. And it looks just like a just like a standard router, right? Look at that. But what is amazing about these boards, about these routers, about Microtik as a brand, is that they are a disruptive technology. You're familiar with disruptive technologies. These are 
innovators who come out and just completely flip the industry on their heads. What is amazing about Microtech is that the features of the firmware are not restricted. And what I mean by that is there are companies like Cisco, for example, who you have to pay licensing fees in order to get more kind of industrial um, business-like features and, and the high-end features. You've got to pay through the teeth sometimes for licensing to be able to unlock those software features. Now, Microtech has a different approach. They say, you know what, even if you buy our $40 router, we're going to give you the full software, everything. You're going to have access to everything. So the only limitation that you have with a Microtech is the hardware. Lucky for us, they have a gajillion of these kind of devices. They've got a, a wide range of hardware available to us. So with Microtech, the approach is instead to simply find the hardware that's going to meet your needs. So the reason that I've selected this one for the studio is because we have one, two, three, four gigabit ethernet ports. We've got uh, a gig um, port for connecting uplink to our modem. It's got 2.4 and 5 gigahertz radios, so I'm going to be able to kind of branch out and, uh, you know, like our Wise cams, for example, are on the 2.4 gigahertz band, so I'll leave those there, but I want to bring my smartphone and our laptops and everything over to 5 gigahertz because we're going to get more speed, and then we're going to presumably be able to free up that, uh, that 2.4 gigahertz band here at the studio. There are a couple of different things that are really, really neat about this device. I mean, they are really, really hardcore good quality, but they are about a tenth of what you would expect to pay for similar features. And I really, really mean that. I mean, you'll notice on the side there's a USB port. One of the first things that I ever did with a router board is I used that USB port, which by software, because it's not limited, remember? so. I wrote a script that could turn on and off the power to the USB port. Why would I want to do that? Well, USB is how many volts? 5 volts. I picked up a 5 volt relay. And I set it up so that a USB cable went into that relay and I could, in the software, turn off and on the power to that relay, basically tripping the circuit. So that relay then had the power cable, which was 12 volts, going to my modem. My router board was then, the software was checking every five minutes, is Google responsive, is Twitter responsive, is Facebook responsive, and a couple of other websites, including my own. Are they responding to pings? If they're not responding to pings, let's try again in five minutes. And if they're still not responding to pings, I'm going to cut the power on the USB port. And what that then did is it cut the power on the relay, which tripped the 12 volt signal to turn off my modem. And then it waited five seconds. I programmed that into this and then fired it back up again. The relay tripped back, the modem powered back on, and essentially what I had done is I'd unplugged and plugged back in my modem without ever having to be present or even know about it. As soon as the internet seemed to go down, because this is a very common problem at the time with my particular modem, I would have to power cycle that modem basically like once every few weeks. But by using a Microtech, I was able to do that programmatically using the USB port. So all that to say, it's completely open in such a way that I can utilize all of the features of the router without being software restricted. Even to the point of I can program the USB port to power on and off my modem. Come on now. They're so cheap. They're like a tenth of the price of a Cisco, for example, with similar feature set. 
Uh, we do have links for you at cat5.tv slash microtick. That's M-I-K-R-O-T-I-K. They got to spell it weird so that our links will be weird for you. Um, because they don't have the software limitations though, I mean, you can do so very much with it. So over the course of the coming weeks, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be setting this up. This is, this is the one that I selected for the studio. I'm going to be setting this up as a basic router. So just basically what you would need for home. It's going to protect you better than what your ISP is providing for you, significantly better. It's going to be a lot more robust. It's going to give you a lot more control. But beyond that, over the coming weeks, we're going to learn how to use this to create things like a guest Wi-Fi that I control. So, well, but Robbie, my, my Wi-Fi uh, access point that the internet service provider gave me also comes with guest Wi-Fi. Well, yes, but do you have control over that? No. What I want to do is not only take that guest Wi-Fi and lock it down so that the, the people who are connected to my guest Wi-Fi cannot access my server, my internal resources, my printer. I want to lock that down. But also, I want to restrict how fast they can travel through my internet connection. In other words, I want to throttle their bandwidth. They're a guest. They're just using my internet. It's probably, to be honest, it's going to be one of the kids' friends with their Nintendo Switch playing some video games. But when they come around with their tablet and try to download videos, I don't want them to be milking my bandwidth and slowing things down on my network and uh, causing my VoIP to, to start buffering. So I'm going to be able to do that. We're going to be teaching you how to do that here on Category 5 Technology TV in the coming weeks. So consider this as a little bit of a preliminary introduction to this series. From there, we're going to be learning also how to lock it down so that we're blocking ads through Pi-hole directly on this device. And then we're going to take it one step further and we're also going to create probably what I would say is one of the best pornography could ever have on your home network on one of these. And that is going to be able to protect your children. Um, and maybe if you're working in a school in the education sector, it's a perfect opportunity for you on the cheap to be able to create something that is going to just absolutely protect your users. And, uh, and then it's also good in business and it allows you to be able to kind of control uh, what your staff are accessing and, and just making sure that it's not something that you would object to or that you don't want your bandwidth being used for at your office, let's say. You can use the web interface. I mean, this has a built-in web interface, but what's really, really cool about the Microtech, I'm going to say that a lot, aren't I? It's going to be my crutch. What's really, really cool about it? Well, there's too many things that are cool. I, I need to have a bullet list. Um, one of the things that I really adore about this is that there's also a piece of software called Winbox, which is available for Windows or Mac. However, it runs flawlessly on Linux in Wine. So it basically will run on all platforms. You're going to use the Windows version on Linux and it runs perfectly. Well, why would you want to use software when it has a web interface? The reason for that is because if you ever basically screw up and brick your device, make it so that it's inaccessible through the web interface, you can use Winbox in order to access it and you can recover. And it's just a simple tool that detects your router on the network and, uh, and lets you you uh, access it and configure it. And it's, uh, it's fairly robust as well. So we're going to go through this over the course of the next few weeks. And uh, I encourage you to follow the links at cat5.tv slash microtech if you're looking for a good, solid home router, business router that's going to be able to um, give you some of those uh, features that are well beyond what you would expect for the price point. Just find one that has the features, the hardware features that you need because again, the software is not restricted. So if you need five gigahertz Wi-Fi, you need to make sure that you buy one that has five gigahertz Wi-Fi. The software is not going to limit you that. It's whether the radio internally has support for it. They start like really, really cheap. You can get one for like 29 bucks or something and then they work their way up to a couple hundred bucks. And then you can even get into rack mount server units that are going to be several hundred dollars and they've got the SPF and, and everything else. This one also has, uh, you've got a, uh, you've got everything on here that you'll ever need. HAP 
is the one that I got. HAP is Home Access Point, I believe. So check those out, cat5.tv slash microtech, and uh, I will be demonstrating this over the course of the, the next several weeks. I wish I could show you the internal today. Unfortunately, because of limitations to our studio right now, I'm not able to bring it up on the screen. I'm not able to show you or teach you how it works. I really wanted to be there this week, folks. It's coming, and I can't wait. I'm going to be teaching you a lot of stuff about these devices. They're really cool. I've got to take a really quick break. Hey, when we return, we've got some great news coming out of the Category 5.TV newsroom. Stick around. Welcome back, everybody. This is Category 5 Technology TV looking at our Discord, which you can access if you go to our website, category5.tv, and you'll click on Interact, and the first option is to join our Discord server. Well, what does that give you? It gives you access to all these channels. I mean, we've got pictures behind the scenes. We've got all kinds of stuff like video editing and what the... There's the mixer. If you want to see what the mixer looks like, it's all there. We've got behind the scenes pictures. We've got pictures of Jeff Weston and Robbie Ferguson and Becca Ferguson all together at Life 100.3 about 20 years ago. <laughs> and uh, everything else. Um, I mean, it's a great way to communicate with the, uh, with the community as well. Marshman saying, this episode is like a higher quality version of the first season's of Category 5. That's exactly right. Except there's more people here. And yes, de definitely higher quality. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, Swessig, or SWSG, one of these days you're going to tell us how to, how to say that, uh, says that they have a Microtech router with 10 gigabit Ethernet. Very good stuff. Yes. All right. And we're going to be learning all kinds of neat things with that. Um, and some people mentioning things like OpenWRT and maybe Tomato or um, DDWRT, for example. Now, I have routers that I have DDWRT on, and Microtik is mind-bendingly better. I will promise you that. Um, if you've never used it, you'll just be floored at the, at the quality and the... Um, and the capabilities and don't listen to me don't don't just be like oh Robbie said they're good so I'm gonna go buy one no hold off save your dollar dollar bills and in the coming weeks I'm gonna be showing you how it works I'm gonna be setting it up and you're gonna be like oh my goodness and it's gonna be incredible and you're gonna be you're gonna be all up on that I am <laughs> very shiny thanks Marshman uh, looking at the uh, all right, a uh, question from MainGeek75. On the router, how does that router stack up to one that is AC1900? So quick Google search, AC1900. What is so good about an AC1900? Okay, so um, immediately an ASUS router is something that is going to have a lockdown firmware. There is no way that an ASUS router is going to have that unlocked and correct me if I'm wrong, please do, and comment below. I'm not familiar with these devices, but I know that consumer gear usually comes with a very locked down firmware, and that's why projects like DDWRT and Tomato exist, because it allows you to unlock devices like that, your consumer gear. What this is, is it's professional gear. It's pro gear. It's like... It's more like, you can't cons compare it, I mean, form factor wise, you can compare it to something like a consumer router. Product and uh, feature wise, you've got to compare it to something like Cisco. And I'm talking something that's 10 times the price, all right? So when we look at this over the course of the, little, the next little while, you're gonna be, you're gonna see why it is the better solution. Skywriter64 has a very valid question. Listen up. How secure is it? How secure is a Microtik router board router? Well, 
let's just say because it's open software without getting into all the details right now uh, and I don't mean open source or anything like that I mean open as in the features are unlocked because you have no locking on the software capabilities of this you can do all kinds of stuff how secure is it well you can lock it down absolutely 100 percent you can lock it down so that only certain IPs or certain MAC addresses are able to access. It's probably the most secure router OS firmware that I've ever seen. Um, and because it's so incredibly customizable, and you're going to see that over the, the course of the series, because it's so customizable, you're going to be able to create the level of security that works for you. Um, I'm going to be securing it from two sides. So first side is the one that we always think about. Skywriter 64, we always think about how secure is our router for hackers getting in. That's one thing. Very secure against that. Right out of the box. But we can even firm it up even further because the firewall does not um, allow anything through unless you say, it, uh, say it's allowed. So basically nothing gets through this unless you say it can get through. Then I take another approach and I say, because I mentioned about how I'm going to be using, I'm going to be creating a guest Wi-Fi. With that guest Wi-Fi, I'm taking the opposite approach where I'm protecting my in internal infrastructure and protecting my internet connectivity from someone using that Wi-Fi maliciously. That means they're not going to be able to access pornography. They're not going to be able to access sites that I don't approve of and they're not going to be able to access my files, they're not going to be able to access my printers, my network resources, anything at all. They're going to have their very own virtual uh, wireless LAN and I'm going to have full control over the security of that. It's going to be incredible. Thinking of the Wi-Fi capabilities of a router board, they have very good Wi-Fi built in and that's one of the reasons I wanted one for the studio is not just for the configurability of it but because it has really good range. I'm going to be able to get 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz a lot further than the modem that came with, uh, that came with my ISP. It's going to be a lot better. So if you have questions for me in the chat, uh, in Discord or IRC, hey, please post them. Uh, say hello. Uh, I will do my best to read them on air. Um, so keep it safe for work. <laughs> in the meantime, we do have to head over to the newsroom. So Becca Ferguson is over there. Let's head on over. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. The video game cloud streaming industry is getting shaken up as NVIDIA loses more big names and Microsoft readies its market killer. Netflix has released its first quarter fiscal year results for 2020 and revealed some unusual coronavirus impacts. Microsoft answers once and for all, should there be one or two spaces after a period? Apple is preparing to develop its own processors for Mac computers to be rolled out as early as next year. Drones will be used to carry medical supplies to the Isle of Wight. And the Pentagon says the video of UFOs that were leaked in 2017 are real. Stick around, the full details in this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. The success of a video game cloud streaming service is all based on content, where you can and can't get your favorite games. The industry is getting a shakedown as NVIDIA's GeForce game streaming service has lost four game, big name game publishers, with Xbox Game Studios, Warner Bros, Codemasters, and Clay Entertainment pulling their titles by the end of the week. This comes as Microsoft prepares to launch its own game streaming service, Project X Cloud, and high ending. Streaming's company Blade launches a lower price version of its shadow streaming service. With competitors PlayStation Now and Google Stadia also chasing streaming customers and Apple pushing its walled garden game system, the market is entering a new era of competition similar to the movie and TV streaming market a few years ago. 
The loss of Xbox and Warner Bros. is significant, yet buried in an announcement that NVIDIA had signed up Ubisoft, whose titles include Assassin's Creed, Far Cry, and the Tom Clancy series for GeForce. It painted the changes as an opportunity to refine our library, and stressed that 30 of the top 40 most played games on Steam already stream on GeForce Now. Gamers pay NVIDIA $5 a month for now to run games they have already bought at a far higher performance level and speed than their devices can manage. NVIDIA runs its own copies of the games on its high-end servers, takes input from people's controllers, processes it, and then streams video back to the user. While they may seem like overkill, it means ordinary gamers can compete with those on high-end gaming machines, which cost thousands of dollars. With even a microse uh, microsecond meaning the difference between winning and losing, it is something many are prepared to pay for. But as with TV and movie streaming services, content is everything, and so there is a tussle going on between game developers and operators of streaming services. Google launched its Stadia service with plenty of fanfare a year ago, but has so far disappointed gamers because of its limited selection of games and compatibility issues. It does offer the best resolution at 4K and charges $10 a month, though we, as we learned last week, you can sign up for a pro account right now to receive it for free for two months. PlayStation Now requires you to have a PlayStation and works only with games that run on the platform, although they are pretty extensive and also cost $10 a month. Shadow offers a higher-end service that costs $25 a month and from next month will offer a lower cost but lower powered $12 a month option. As for Microsoft's upcoming Project X Cloud service, due to launch anytime soon, it won't require users to own an Xbox and pricing has yet to be announced. Having released its first quarter fiscal year results for 2020, Netflix, Netflix has revealed some unusual coronavirus impacts. Made most plain in its Form 10-Q, Netflix said the COVID-19 pandemic has also led to an increase in our net paid membership additions relative to our quarterly forecast and historic trends. Indeed, the company reported 15.5 million new subscribers in the quarter for a total of 182.86 million, almost double recent quarter subscri subscription growth. But the filling warns the surge may not be indicative of results for future periods. CEO Reed Hastings' letter to shareholders opens with, In our 20-plus year history, we have never seen a future more uncertain or unsettling, and goes on to explain that onboarding a rush of new users has actually damaged Netflix's average revenue per user. The CEO also explained that the pandemic will impact the streamer's pipeline of new shows because most film crews worldwide have had to stop working, although animators were quickly back at work and writers mostly just kept writing. Revenue for the quarter was a U.S. $5.7 billion and operating income hit $958 million, both the best results the company has achieved in recent history. And that's after taking into account the strength of the U.S. dollar, which reduces the value of subscriptions in other nations. Hastings also wrote that Netflix's investment in caching systems appears to have paid off, both in terms of user experience and letting it respond to the government request to reduce its impact on networks. The company has also blogged about its introduction of support for TLS 1.3, which means it can do a full handshake with a device with one round trip or sometimes without a round trip at all. That translates into faster starts for streams and less traffic on networks. Subscribers ought not to expect more new features at this time. Hastings' letter added that while Netflix, Netflix devs are now working from home and that transition has gone well, they have temporarily reduced the number of product innovations while continuing to, continuing to release features they believe will add meaningful value for members, such as improved parental controls. With the advent of word processors, we saw great debate take shape. Should you enter a single space or a double space after a period? The double space was a holdover from the days of the typewriter, and even now some people still do it. If you're one of them, you might want to prepare yourself for a certain update that's on the way to Microsoft Word. Microsoft has decided to drop the mic, siding with those who prefer a single space, as test builds of Microsoft Word now treat a double space after a period as a typo. When you allow the word processor to correct the error, it, it'll change it to a single space automatically. According to The Verge, while this feature is only in testing for now, it won't be long before it rolls out to the entire Word-using audience on desktop. 
The good news, however, is that you won't be stuck forever looking at those error lines underneath your double spaces if you don't want to. In a statement to The Verge, Microsoft's partner, Director of Program Management, Kirk Gregerson, said that the double spaces of the world, of, sorry, the double spaces of the world, the double spacers of the world, will be able to ignore the error flag and continue overusing their space bar if they so choose. Gregerson said, as the crux of the great spacing debate, we know this is a stylistic choice that may not be a preference for all writers, which is why we continue to test with users and enable these suggestions to be easily accepted, ignored, or flat out dismissed. We wanted to know how the free alternative LibreOffice was leaning. In the LibreOffice community forum, user Shankapluza calls two spaces needless extra work, saying if you had to take two breaths for every one, it'd be a tad laboring, no? And designer and typographer Hank C. Meerhoff says, in any part of the European mainland, mainland, it was never done or abandoned over 50 years ago. Double spaces will come back to bite you in some form. As it turns out, LibreOffice already defaults to to change double spaces into single spaces and has for the past several versions at least. Though as Pierre Yev Samian points out, it can be changed in the Tools, Autocorrect, Autocorrect Options menu on the Options tab by checking on Ignore Double Spaces. So there you have it. Microsoft isn't quite pushing out the double spaces yet, but they're following LibreOffice's lead, and it feels like a big win for the single spacers. Expect to see this feature land in Microsoft Word in the months ahead. We've got to take a quick break. The Crypto Corner and more of this week's top tech news stories are coming up, so don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Crypto Corner. I hope you're all well and staying safe. And also hope that last week's corner was of use to you where we spoke about jobs and the big opportunities in the blockchain industry in regards to programming and coding. I forgot to mention one website which I used to learn Python, which is called hackerrank.com. That's H-A-C-K-E-R-R-A-N-K.com, which gives you every day a little task to achieve. And um, that's how I learned uh, quite nicely to learn in uh, in Python, and it's free. So give it a try. Another thing that I'd like to mention is it's currently tax season, and I encourage you to take care of those uh, taxes because local authorities around the world are starting to work together with local exchanges, and so they will have most likely your details already in regards to how many cryptos you have and so on. Um, there are plenty of websites that you can use um, and um, most, and they're very, uh, very good in price also. So they're it's fairly cheap to use them, and um, they are clever in the sense that they also give you advice when to add um, or when to change your position of your cryptocurrencies in regards to uh, safe taxes. So make use of those websites; um, they will be of use uh, to you later on. Uh, to the news, uh, market uh, cap of our industry has not really changed substantially since last week. We're hovering around 225 billion US dollars with Bitcoin having a market share of uh, 64%. Uh, big dates that are coming up uh, soon in uh, Shelly, which is from Cardano, a new development which focuses on decentralization has been started uh, this week. So they mined the first uh, Genesis block this week, but you, you, it's not yet open for the public. And for the, they're saying it will be open for the public in May or June. But that's an important development for Cardano. For Ethereum, they're saying that the Ethereum 2.0 will come in July. Remains to be seen because they have changed the dates already many times, but that's what they're currently saying. And then the big one is uh, Bitcoin halvening, which is uh, coming in around two weeks. Um, now, a lot of people are saying that it will have a big impact on prices. Others are saying that it will have no impact on prices. The history is telling us that it will not have a big impact on prices immediately. That comes at a later stage. Um, but um, to explain what halven the halvening means is currently every 10 minutes, around every 10 minutes, 
Bitcoin issues 12 and a half Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain issues 12 and a half Bitcoin uh, to the miners, and that will be halved. So from May uh, or two weeks onwards, for the next four years, the miners will receive only 6.25 Bitcoin every 10 minutes. Uh, so the inflation of uh, the Bitcoin blockchain will be reduced by, by half. And that's why it's called halvening. Other news, it's uh, in regards to DeFi, so decentralized, uh, decentralized finance, which is to explain centralized finance is CeFi, which is banks, where you have got a middle person, where you've got a company that you can call um, to, to talk to somebody. DeFi is just based on mathematics and codes. <clears throat> and that's getting very popular and it's really interesting. So if you have got some time, go into DeFi uh, of any cryptocurrency. The development has been tremendous. It's still in test phase, so don't invest any money there or any substantial money, but um, it's interesting. And um, uh, Bitfinex, which is the owner or the, the sister company of, of Tether, which is a stable coin, <clears throat> they developed uh, a token which is called the P-Token, which makes it possible to exchange funds between or assets between two, two de decentralized exchanges or exchanges. That is coming, which is an interesting development. Then Coinbase launched also an Oracle. Why is what was an Oracle is um, uh, a tool that tells you a specific value at a specific time. Um, for example, the price of, of Bitcoin. Um, as you know, there are probably over 400, 500 exchanges that are trading in, in Bitcoin and they all have a different price. I mean, it's a minimal difference, but what happens if there's a crash? Then the difference between those exchanges will be substantial. And that is of importance for, for example, these DeFi uh, platforms. Which price should they use if they have to liquidate a posi po uh, position? And for that, they're de currently developing Oracles and uh, uh, Coinbase just launched uh, a price oracle and uh, that will be live uh, or is already live and um, uh, next is the Iota, iota foundation took a decision to change their um, smart contracts uh, uh, idea uh, they initially had that in, a, in, the, in the base layer and they moving that now to uh, layer two uh, as a layer two fund uh, solution. So it's like the lightning network to Bitcoin. It's not part of the the base uh, 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 cryptocurrency. It's a level higher. So that is a decision that they took. Let's see if that uh, comes because it's not the first time that they changed that. And um, yeah, that's, that's it uh, from me. Um, so I wish you a great week. We'll see, I hope to see you next week. And um, with this, back to the studio. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder that we're not providing financial advice, but only sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency market. Always remember that the cryptocurrency markets are ever changing and always volatile. So you should only spend what you can afford to lose. Now back to Becca in the newsroom. Thank you, Ravi. Until now, Apple has been using Intel processors but according to a Bloomberg report, the company is now preparing to develop its own processors for Mac computers, which could be rolled out as early as next year. Apple is said to be working on three different processors that are based on the A14 chip that will power the next iPhone. According to the report, the first of these new Apple-made chips is expected to be much faster than that of an iPhone's and will arrive in a new computer next year. In taking this step, Apple is likely to be slowly moving towards ditching its dependence on Intel chips altogether. Apple's partner for iPhone and iPad processors, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Co., will develop the new Mac chips. The components will be based on the 5 nanometer production technique, the same size Apple will use in the next iPhones and iPad Pros. Details are thin at the moment, but we'll, be able, we'll sure be able to let you know more as the specifications are announced. The UK government has announced that drones will be used to carry medical supplies from Hampshire to the Isle of Wight. A planned trial of the technology began this week. In March, the government announced funding for drone tests and a new air traffic control system. But Grant Shapps, Secretary of State for Transport, said there was an urgent need for the trial to begin sooner than planned. 
Ferry crossings to the Isle of Wight are currently reduced due to the spread of COVID-19. An unmanned aerial vehicle can make the crossing to the Isle of Wight in about 10 minutes. The government expects about four flights per day to be made, depending on the needs of the United Kingdom National Health Service. A spokeswoman told the BBC that the first flights would carry personal protective equipment. However, in future, the drone could deliver the time-critical supplies such as blood and organs. The trial will use a gasoline-fueled Wind Racer's ultra-fixed-wing drone capable of carrying a 100-kilogram payload for up to 1,000 kilometers. The Department for Transport said the drone would fly autonomously along a fixed route between Lee on the Solent in Hampshire and Binstead on the Isle of Wight. Two safety pilots, one at each airfield, will oversee each flight. A spokeswoman told the BBC that the flight would take around 10 minutes, significantly reducing de delivery times between the Isle of Wight and mainland. After goods have been dropped off at the airfield, they will be delivered to St. Mary's Hospital on the Isle of Wight by road. Because this is all happening so, happening so quickly, an unmanned traffic management system cannot be put in place in time, though it will be pursued for the long term. So for now, rather than integrating the drone with regular air traffic, a temporary danger area is being set up for 90 days to separate the drone from other aircraft. The Pentagon says it can explain three previously leaked videos of supposed UFOs, and the explanation is simple. They're real, and they're still a total mystery. The U.S. government declassified three top-secret videos of unexplained aerial phenomena on Monday, confirming that clips that first surfaced in 2017 are legitimate. That's not to say that the UFOs are not of this world, but that the Pentagon is unable to identify the objects seen flying in the videos. Word wizards are making the connection. Unidentified flying objects, UFOs. The U.S. Navy has officially released the footage. Pentagon spokesperson Sue Gao said on Monday, that this is to clear up any misconceptions by the public on whether or not the footage that has been circulating was real or whether or not there is more to the videos. She said, after a thorough review, the department has determined that the authorized release of these unclassified videos does not reveal any sensitive capabilities or systems and does not impinge on any subsequent investigations of military airspace incursions by unidentified aerial phenomena. In other words, the objects are not theirs. The, announcements, the announcement is more vindication for Tom DeLong, the Blink-182 band member and alien enthusiast who released the videos to the New York Times in 2017 through his UFO research organization to the STARS Academy of Arts and Science. While the U.S. Navy didn't acknowledge the videos when they first serviced in 2017, Joe Grandisher, spokesperson for the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Information Warfare, confirmed they are real in an interview with CNN last September saying the Navy designates the objects uh, contained in these videos as un unidentified aerial phenomenon, UAPS. Grad uh, Gradisher said at the time that transparency around the sightings was important so that pilots won't feel ashamed to report something that could be dangerous. For many years, our aviators didn't report these incursions because of the stigma attached to previous technology and theories about what may or may not be in those videos. All three videos are now available through the Pentagon's reading room. The Pentagon did not release any additional footage or content along with the three clips, but it has stoked a flurry of excitement among UFO enthusiasts with its simple acknowledgement that the videos are legitimate. The truth is out there. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5 TV Newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patron.com slash category5. From the Category 5.TV Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Thanks, Becca. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this week. It's been great having you here. Now, I know that the technology is not perfect yet here at our new, new studio. Part of that, I mean a large part of that comes from the fact that nobody saw our current world kind of like how things are in our world. We never saw that coming. Um, and and it's hard to, to set everything up and get everything working the way it should when I can't have folks here helping me. And so I, I appreciate your understanding in that. I appreciate our staff. 
I, I so greatly just want to send a big thanks to Jeff Weston, Henry Bailey Brown, Sasha Rickman, who all three couldn't be here today because of the technology not being there. And big thanks to Robert Koenig, who was able to be here by uh, the, the technology that he's able to use. And to my wife, Becca Ferguson, for being here physically and, and being able to, uh, fortunately, she's able to be here physically because we are not having to be isolated from one another as husband and wife. Um, so that is a wonderful, um, wonderful blessing for me and for the show to be able to have a news anchor who is going to be able to help us carry the show over the next little while as we just don't know when this whole thing is going to let up and when things are going to change. So thank you to the team. Thank you to everybody who has helped put this together this week. In the meantime, I, I do believe that every single uh, week we're going to get better and better and stronger and stronger. So please be here. Thank you for your support. Please go to our website, category5.tv, not only to support us, but also to get free content for yourself. Uh, a couple of the quick mentions that I'll, I'll just say um, that have changed this week is that we've now introduced 1440p downloadable video. So everything from episode number 647 onward, you're going to be able to download in full Ultra HD video format. So not just 1080p, not just HD, but Ultra HD 2K video. You're going to be able to download those directly, and it's absolutely free. That's category5.tv. There's also some great products that we mentioned on the show that you're going to be able to follow some of our affiliate links that help support the show, but also give you a great deal as well and help you to support those who support Category5.tv. And, uh, and that's important as well as we think about you know, this current situation in our world, small companies that, um, that we love and support and who support us, that you can be supporting as well just by reallocating where you buy from. Just saying, hey, instead of buying my Raspberry Pi on Amazon, I'm going to buy it from Ameridroid. Even if I pay a couple bucks more, it's going to support the small business and the, and the companies that we love and we want to see uh, through this pandemic. So, so consider those things and go to our website, category5.tv, and we thank you for, uh, for being a part of this show and a part of this community. And I look forward to seeing you again next week. It's going to be smashing. It's going to be perfect. Everything's going to go flawlessly. I'm going to be able to bring things up on the screen for you and everything else. <laughs> That's my dream. It's going to be great, folks. And, and we are going to get better and better as the weeks go on. So thank you for being here through this time. It's odd for all of us, but uh, we're, we're here and broadcasting and communing with our, our uh, community as well. And, uh, and I appreciate each and every one of you. So thank you for being here. Take care, everybody. I will see you again next week. See ya.